Saturday, October 2nd, 2021, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So I, I found it appropriate today to look at the House of Morgan. It's one of the books that I've recommended before years ago. I'm going to recommend it again today. But uh, why is it appropriate? Well, because uh, JP Morgan is at it again, business as usual, of course, being taken to court, being sued by a, a silver mining company from Florida. I think they've gone bust. Uh, so they're, they're uh, suing JP Morgan for price manipulation. Uh, this story came out yesterday, Florida miners lawsuit accuses JP Morgan of manipulating silver prices. So we're going to go quickly through that. And we're going to go through not just the House of Morgan, which is a book I read probably even before I was here in the UK. I think I bought it in Geneva when I started working in finance, the office where I worked. Uh, below the office uh, next to, to the building that I worked, there was a, a, an English language uh, bookstore. They also rented uh, English language videos. And I think I bought the book from there. So I read it many years ago. And we're going to go through more books. A few weeks ago, I did a video on, on books that I rec uh, recommend people read that uh, were my must read list. Uh, and I said that I would continue, so I'm going to continue with that today. And just before we go into the Florida uh, minor lawsuit against J.P. Morgan, let's just go through some of the, the stories that I'm seeing here. Uh, I see that uh, the situation, political situation, uh, as it pertains to uh, Congress in the U.S., the administration, uh, this infrastructure bill, the re conciliation bill. There's so much involved, so many trillions, and it's all uh, snagging up a little bit. <laughs> it looks like uh, the division is within the Democratic Party. And we also have, of course, the uh, gorilla or elephant in the China, China shop, uh, which is the debt ceiling. I saw the other day as well that uh, Janet Yellen said she would be okay with just uh, getting uh, rid of the debt ceiling. What, what would that mean? Well, that just means that uh, it would probably be even easier for Congress and politicians to, uh, to borrow and spend, uh, to inflate, to, to deficit finance. Uh, because what the uh, debt ceiling is, is a credit card limit, so to speak. That, that would be the analogy. So most of us, of course, have a credit uh, card. Uh, I, I have one, but I don't use it. The only time I use it is uh, when I get a letter from uh, the credit card company and it says, you haven't used this for so long that uh, we're going to cancel it. So I will just spend a little bit and pay it the next day. Uh, that's what I do with my credit card. But there is a, a pretty big limit there. Um, they have cut my limit over the years, probably because I don't use it. But uh, if we didn't have any limits on our credit cards, uh, a lot of people would be uh, much further into debt. It's just common sense. So that's what I think it would mean, getting rid of uh, the debt ceiling. <laughs> and that's something that Janet Yellen apparently said she's not against. And I think uh, Congress wouldn't be against that. Uh, so we're going to have to wait and see. Here in the UK, the, the major uh, headline here in the FT this morning is that the military uh, is going to begin delivering petrol or gasoline to UK garages from Monday. Um, is that going to solve the problem? No, it's just a Band-Aid. <laughs> it's just uh, trying to patch things up. I think the uh, shortage problems with drivers and everything else with commodities. Uh, and this is happening all around the world, energy crunch, even in China, they're doing uh, blackouts. Um, it's all to do with the money. <laughs> and I recommend uh, an interview that Rafi uh, Farber did with Palisades 
uh, Gold Palisade Radio, I think it's called. And he talked about the subject of uh, the petrol uh, shortage here in the UK, the driver shortage. And one thing he said, uh, it, it, it's all to do with the money. And I think he's right. The money is bad and it's getting worse uh, because normally if things were uh, smooth, <laughs> uh, the way to solve the shortage of drivers or anything else would be to raise prices. And that would clear the market but but now you can't do that because if you raise prices you collapse everything because businesses won't be able to stay uh, afloat uh, it's the same thing that happened uh, with this uh, the gas shortage natural gas prices went up a lot and the the uh, cf industries which produce uh, fertilizers uh, they had to uh, shut down we're hearing that a lot of industrial uh, companies, businesses in Europe are going to have to shut down because natural gas prices keep going up. Uh, the other thing that's going up is carbon emissions, uh, which is traded as a future. Uh, a lot of companies can't afford uh, to run uh, right now because they've signed up to this climate change ESG agenda of being carbon neutral. And one of the ways to neutralize their carbon emissions was to buy carbon futures to get the permission. And uh, yes, why can't they just raise prices of their products? Well, well, because it would break the whole supply chain because all the businesses involved, they can't afford to raise prices. Consumers would uh, probably not afford, be able to afford to buy it. So uh, this is a really bad sign. So that's why I'm saying this is not going to work. I don't think it, it will solve the problem in the short term. But uh, in the end of the day, who's paying uh, for this delivery? Well, it's us, the taxpayer. So we're basically uh, financing, again, the big oil uh, multinationals like uh, BP, Royal Dutch Shell, and uh, the Rockefellers or Exxon Standard Oil. Uh, because in the end of the day, who pays the military? So uh, let's get back to JP Morgan <laughs> and, and the uh, story that came out yesterday uh, from Reuters. It says Florida miners lawsuit accuses JP Morgan of manipulating silver prices. So we're going to go through this. It's not a long article. So you get an idea of what this is all about. And before I start, uh, the only way for us to uh, fight the bankers, to defeat the bankers, is to try to stack as much physical gold and silver as possible. That's their Achilles heel. Uh, they, they hate uh, people like us buying physical because it exposes their fraudulent fiat currency system. And that's why they manipulate the price, not, not only downwards, but they just create the volatility to make it seem that the metals are risky. So anyway, October 1st, a Florida-based silver miner has filed a damages claim against JP Morgan, accusing the bank of manipulating the silver market to push prices so low the company's mine had to close. The complaint filed on Tuesday in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Florida said Hidalgo Mining Corp. raised $10.35 million from investors to finance a silver mine in Mexico that began production around 2012 and stopped in 2014. Silver prices averaged around $31 an ounce in 2012 and $19 announced in 2014. JP Morgan declined to comment. Hidalgo's claim seen by Reuters uses as evidence and information from an investigation by US regulators, which found that JP Morgan staff between 2008 and 2016 sent fake buy and sell orders into metals and treasury markets to move prices in their favor. Traders, say this technique known as spoofing is a short-term trading tactic rather than a means of long-term price suppression. Um, I kind of agree with that. 
The only problem with, with that though is that um, in the short term you can use that spoofing technique to trigger uh, stops at key technical levels, not just short term technical levels, but long term technical levels. And uh, spoofing, of course, is not just the uh, only way that they manipulate the gold and silver price. It's the constant barrage of selling, paper selling on COMEX and also the LBMA. And uh, I think the LBMA is key to the manipulation because in London, you're able to hypothecate physical silver uh, to infinity. I think in New York on Wall Street, there's a limit. Uh, you can only hypothecate like three times um, the amount of silver you've got. So and that's why the manipulation is all done here in uh, in London. I would say a lot of it. Uh, and, and, but spoofing is not just the only reason why. Uh, I mean, uh, it does help. It's one of the tools of the manipulation. It is more short term, but it, it, it is... Um, it is useful for, for these people. So anyway, let's continue. It says JP Morgan last year agreed to pay more than 920 million to settle the investigation. Uh, the bank also paid 15.7 million last week to settle a class action uh, lawsuit uh, brought by investors who said the manipulation had caused them losses. So why did I say business as usual? Well, because JP Morgan, uh, they've been paying fines <laughs> uh, for the last, well, 20 years, billions of dollars. And uh, you might think, uh, how come they're still in business? You know, they've shown themselves to be a, a criminal institution. How? come Jamie Dimon is still such a respected member of society. Well, we're going to come to that in a minute when we look at the House of Morgan. So um, I subscribed to the Solari uh, report and uh, I think uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, I got this addendum to one of my reports and it's uh, JP Morgan Chase selected legal regulatory and enforcement settlements 2002 to 2019 <laughs> so this is only to 2019 and I see that last year they paid another well almost another billion in fines and they also paid last week 15.7 million so yeah so this is from the Solari report as you can see so Catherine Austin Fitz and the people at Solari they've gone through all the lawsuits, all the fines they've paid. Uh, there's about 20 pages here. <laughs> uh, you can see all, all, all the, the stuff. And I, I added up all the, uh, the fines from 2002 to 2019, and it's 43.77 billion. So that's the cost of being a criminal institution, <laughs> but uh, it, it's a, a drop drop in the ocean, uh, so to speak, a needle uh, in a haystack for them because they control the central banks. <laughs> the, the New York Fed is probably the, the major shareholder there, is uh, JP Morgan. And of course, they, they merged with Chase and other banks. So they, they probably control the whole thing. They can create this money or this credit, this fiat currency out of thin air. And uh, you might ask, how come people still accept this currency? Well, <laughs> it's because people haven't woken up to the uh, fraudulent nature of fiat currency. And that's why I'm here every day <laughs> for the last six years almost trying to uh, tell the public about it. And that's why you should share this video. And uh, the other uh, way they uh, keep their uh, phony fiat currency uh, valuable is through manipulating uh, the price uh, of gold and silver or manipulating the, the price of the currency, keeping it suppressed. But, uh, and that's why we need to keep stacking. <laughs> uh, and 
I, I know how difficult it is because if you watch the mainstream media and uh, if you listen to financial advisors, and I'm not a financial advisor here, but I'm just trying to tell you what I've seen from experience. Uh, if you ask your financial advisor, well, I want to buy physical gold and silver, they would uh, laugh at you. They would say, oh, you should buy the ETF. It's easier. So that's how they do it. But it's amazing, isn't it, that uh, they paid so many fines and they're still in business. You'd, you'd think uh, this bank would uh, be closed down by now. So <laughs> uh, this is what was put at the end here. Flabbergasted. Yeah flabbergasted so why doesn't cnbc fox news or all the other business channels bloomberg cover this well because they're controlled by the bankers uh, and with that uh let's have a look at the uh the book list and i'm going to start with the house of morgan and uh you'll see how powerful they are well <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to do a, a little synopsis, but uh, the reason I recommend this book, you will see how important uh, J.P. Morgan Bank is. And you will also see that J.P. Morgan Bank is actually, uh, its roots and origins are, they are partly in the United States, but they're also in, in London, in the city of London. And many people don't know that. It was actually <laughs> a bank that originated from the city of London. Yes, it was Americans who were in charge, George Peabody and then Junius Morgan and then J.P. Morgan. But they, they had an office, J.P. Morgan, in London before they had one in New York. That, that's what you need to take from this. Uh, yeah, Wall Street, the city of London, they're very important. And that's why a, a lot of the uh, precious metals manipulation is still done from the city of London. So yeah, the House of Morgan, the secret history of money and power by Ron Chernow. Here's the book. Uh, I think uh, you, you can still get this book, of course, but I think they've changed this, uh, <laughs> this title a little bit for some reason, I don't know why. So it says, The House of Morgan is a rich saga of the Anglo-American banking dynasty that superseded uh, Barings and the Rothschilds to become the dominant financial empire of the 19th century. Well, <laughs> Well, I would say it still is the dominant financial empire. With the sweep of an epic novel, it covers 150 years, tracing the Morgan Empire from the Keynesian beginnings in Victorian London to the summit of world finance through four generations uh, of Morgans and the powerful secretive firms they spawned, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Grenfell. Based on unprecedented access to Morgan records and over 100 interviews, the House of Morgan lays bare the secrets of the world's most mysterious financial firms. As England's Wall Street agent, the Morgan Bank was privy to its most sensitive financial dealings. It financed the Allies in World War I and purchased their munitions. It restored England to the gold standard in 1925 and was blamed for the 1931 banker's ramp that toppled Ramsey MacDonald's government. In World War II, it ensured lend-lease aid to Britain by arranging the sale of a Courtauld subsidiary. It even lobbied Washington to join uh, the abortive Suez invasion in the 1950s. In an investigative tour de force, the book contains startling disclosures about the Morgan Bank's dealings and governments across the world, up to the current Latin American debt crisis and including secret deals with the Vatican and the Middle East. Shocking revelations about Morgan intrigue with Mussolini, Japanese militarists, Mexican dictators, and Nazi finance ministers. Shuttling back and forth across the Atlantic, it portrays the Byzantine intrigue between Morgan Grenfell in London and its New York affiliate, J.P. Morgan & Co., and how they, they shed their gentlemanly style to pioneer in the marauding new world of hostile takeovers, junk bonds, and fast-paced 
trading. Chernow shows how the London house for years run by a clutch of sleepy, doddering old peers derided as the House of Lords <laughs> became a rampaging firm of elegant Etonian raiders whose aggression ended in the crooked share price manipulation and ensuing scandal of the Guinness takeover. So you see, they, they've been manipulating markets for as long as they've been around. So, uh, and uh, they get away with it because uh, they're very powerful. Uh, and you'll find here that uh, they bailed out the US Treasury in the uh, 1890s. So uh, you can understand why uh, JP Morgan is the agent bank for the US Treasury. So that's the first book. Yes, it's a big book, but it's important to read, I think. So what's the second book today? Well, it's one of my favorites. It's about gold. It's called Gold Wars, the battle against sound money as seen from a Swiss perspective by Ferdinand Lips. Uh, I think Ferdinand Lips died about 15 years ago or maybe a little less. Uh, he was a Swiss banker from Zurich. He even worked for the Rothschilds, uh, but uh, he was one of the good guys. So what does it say here about this book? It is the great merit of this provocative book by Ferdinand Lips to bring back a wider understanding of why gold was a solid base for economic stability in many societies. That's uh, Professor Dr. T. Apt, Federal Institute of Technology, Zurich, Switzerland. Uh, gold and freedom are inseparable. This is uh, the thesis of Gold Wars, a manuscript that I recommend every modern day business person should read. This is from Dr. Mark Bristol, a PhD, Chief Executive Officer, Rangold Resources. Mr. Lips, is to be admired as he has performed an important task to provide understanding of the gold as money moving through history, the recent developments to his own experience as a Swiss banker. Elizabeth Courier, President, Committee for Monetary Research and Education. Gold Wars is must reading for anyone who wants to understand the genesis of the unfolding debacle in the financial markets. Robert K. Landis, Golden Sextant Advisors. Gold Wars is essential reading for anyone who is concerned about his financial future. Dr. Lawrence Parks, PhD, Executive Director, the Foundation for the Advancement of Monetary Education. Mr. Lips makes the history of gold come alive and will enthuse you to join the war for the sake of freedom, free markets, and social peace. You will want 50 copies for your best friends, press and politicians. Harry Schultz, International Harry Schultz Letter. Gold Wars is a must for anyone with an interest in the future of the global monetary system. Mark Wellesley Wood, Chairman Durban, Rudaport Deep Limited. So yeah, I, I bought this book in around 2004, I think. So uh, highly recommend it. Uh, what's the third book? And, and, and I have to say they're in no particular order. I just put it on my desk. Um, Paper Against Gold, containing the history and mystery of the Bank of England, the funds, the debt, the lowering and the rising of the value of paper money <laughs> by William Cobbett. And this is a tough book to get. William Cobbett was actually a, an MP in the early 1800s, and, and he actually wrote these letters. These are uh, a set of letters he wrote while he, he was actually in prison in the UK. Um, and um, highly recommend this. He, he goes back to the creation of the Bank of England, the creation of the national debt. He goes back to explaining uh, the taxation that they need in this uh, paper system, central banking system. Uh, highly, highly recommend this. Uh, and it says, due to the very old 
age and scarcity of this book, many of the pages may be hard to read due to the blurring of the original text. Possible missing pages, missing text, dark backgrounds, and other issues beyond our control. Because this is such an important and rare book, we believe it is best to reproduce this book regardless of its original condition. Thank you for your understanding. So I've done a set of videos about some of these letters. I'm going to put it up in the cards. I think I have a playlist for it and in the description. I should probably continue and go through some of the other letters. And it's amazing because you would think after reading this book that this man should be like a hero, economic hero. But uh, instead of someone like uh, John Maynard Keynes, right? The thing is that this guy wanted to help the general public. <laughs> uh, he wanted uh, to expose uh, the Bank of England paper, uh, paper money system, even though uh, at some junctures we have had like a gold standard. But uh, he, he shows you how the, the bankers control everything and how they uh, create the national debt and the national debt has been ballooning and it started just before the Bank of England was founded in 1694 and it was uh, King William uh, and Mary who uh, started it and it's been going on ever since and uh, it, this is probably a, a book that they probably wouldn't teach at major economic uh, courses at Oxford, Cambridge, or uh, the, the London School of Economics, or Harvard, any of those places. Uh, but uh, I think it's a jewel, <laughs> and I recommend it. Actually, this is the same book. <laughs> One of my viewers sent me uh, another uh, edition of this. It's also fairly difficult to read. So you can get it in, in, in these two versions, hard, hardback, and paperback. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, let's have a look. Uh, this is one of my favorites. <laughs> it's not a, a very long book and it's uh, called The Energy Non-Crisis by Lindsay Williams. And this is all about the uh, oil crisis or <laughs> non-crisis as Lindsay uh, calls it back in the 70s. And I think it's more relevant than ever because I did a video last year when the current crisis started saying that I thought it was the same thing in terms of uh, strategy <laughs> and who's behind uh, the crisis now. They were behind this crisis. And I think this crisis was brought about to create the petrodollar system. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, and why do I say that? Well, because with the oil embargo in the 70s, uh, what happened to the price of oil? Well, it went through the roof. It, it, it made people more and more dependent on OPEC. And uh, is it any wonder that Kissinger went there uh, to Saudi Arabia and made a deal with them? And uh, yes, you will see how there is a lot more to the oil embargo than just the Arabs boycotting, you know, not selling oil to us. Uh, there's a lot more to it and the US government, probably the British government were involved. But here uh, Lindsay shows you that uh, it wasn't just the Arabs that created the crisis. You kind of wonder uh, <laughs> uh, with what's going on today. Uh, next book, uh, one of my favorites in terms of philosophy and um, Yes, government and uh, the rule of law, if you want to call it. Uh, and my favorite uh, French writer, Frederick Bastiat, The Law, the, the classic blueprint for a just society. Uh, again, <laughs> it's not a very long one. So uh, for those of you who are not into reading, yeah, this is only, uh, it's not even, uh, I think, 80 pages. So what's the law about? Well, the law created order in my thinking about liberty and just human conduct, Walter Williams. 
So what does it say here about Frederick Bastiat? Well, it says statesman, essayist, and economist. Frederick Bastiat was a renowned champion of individual freedom and the law first published in 1850 is Bastiat's most famous and enduring work. The law has been acclaimed for more than a century as the classic moral defense of liberty and limited government. Here's a timeless message of immutable principle in the immortal words of one of history's most courageous thinkers and brilliant writers, the most brilliant economic journalist who ever lived, uh, said Joseph Schumpeter, or Schumpeter. A great prophet of liberty, the free society, and the free market, Vaclav Klaus, former prime minister of the Czech Republic. So, yeah, highly recommend this, and uh, it will really clarify things for you if you still think that uh, the kind of government we have these days, be it in the United States, be it in the UK, uh, are really uh, representative of individual freedom uh, and an open society and free markets. Uh, it will change your view completely on that subject, I would say. Another one that I actually uh, read many years ago as well, even before I got more uh, interested in the Austrian School of Economics, uh, and for some reason I read this book, and uh, it's probably one of the books why I have the view about free markets and the view about socialism. And I think I read this uh, back in Switzerland as well before I even came to the UK. But uh, for some reason, I stopped at this book. It was only back in uh, 2002 that I started looking more into the Austrian School of Economics. It's called The Road to Serfdom by Friedrich August Hayek or F.A. Hayek. There you go. This is a classic. It says here on the cover, nearly half a century ago, most of the smart people sneered when Friedrich Hayek published The Road to Serfdom. The world was wrong and Hayek writes Ronald Bailey Forbes. And I think this edition was from the uh, early 90s that I bought this in the early 90s. And uh, I think this is... Uh, a reference to what was happening with the collapse of the Soviet Union, F. A. Hayek's timeless meditation on the relation between individual liberty and government authority. The road to serfdom has inspired and infuriated politicians, scholars, and general readers for half a century. For Hayek, the collectivist idea of empowering government with increasing economic control would inevitably lead not to a utopia but to the horrors of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. This anniversary edition commemorates the enduring influence of the road to serfdom on the ever-changing political and social climates of the 20th century. From the rise of socialism after World War II to the Reagan and Thatcher revolutions in the 1980s and the transitions in Eastern Europe from communism to capitalism in the 1990s. So yeah, I think it's more important than ever for people to be aware of this because uh, yes, <laughs> Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union got out of the uh, grips of uh, communism, socialism, but uh, we're <laughs> letting uh, those two uh, ideologies or that ideology of collectivism really uh, trample on our freedoms right now. Uh, I'm gonna end with The uh, Empire of the City by E.C. Nutt, The Secret History of British Financial Power. There you go, recommend this as well. And I guess you can see how this is linked to the House of Morgan, how this is linked to the central banks and the city of London. So I'm gonna stop at that. Uh, I'll put a list of these books in the description uh, with their authors. I'm not gonna put where you can find it. I'm not gonna put any Amazon links. I think you, you can do that yourselves. So there you go. Uh, 
If you enjoyed this video, make sure you hit the like button. Please share it far and wide. Think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't yet. And you can also follow me on Rumble, Twitter, Facebook, and all these other platforms below. I wish you all a great weekend. Take care. Bye.